Tonight we have a very special guest that will be joining us. His name is Douglas Vogt, and he filed a couple of affidavits uh, with respect to Obama's eligibility. Folks, you are not going to want to miss this program and, and this interview. You went in education. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to hear things that you've never heard ever, I don't believe, in the public domain. This is a gentleman who has identified the forger among other things, and provided all that information to the cold case posse. The forger, by the way, you know, criminals leave signatures. Isn't that, isn't that always the case? This criminal left her name cryptically in an engram style in the forged Obama long-form birth certificate document. It's very interesting. He is armed and dangerous. Our guest for tonight, Mr. Douglas Vogt, he's a He's an author, he's an amateur geologist, a science philosopher, a writer. The affidavits that Mr. Vogt filed here in, in, on October 18th of this past, uh, well, about a month and a half ago. Mr. Vogt has filed two affidavits, one public, one private. That The private one, the, the um, uh, in-camera one, uh, has, uh, he has identified the suspected forger. The, and her accomplices, notice I said her. Mr. Vogt, welcome to the Hagman and Hagman Report. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, grand entrance. There's something called, there's several sections. There's one called Notice of Commission of Felony, and that you should read first. It's a summary of it. The, it has the 20 points of forgery listed there. Then it has uh, an outline of the people involved, and then it goes into the crimes that were committed. Total, I think I got 11 felonies that these people committed. There's two. There's a public affidavit, which was, I think, 17 or 18,000 words. It's uh, with the exhibits, like 92 pages. The sealed affidavit uh, is 48 pages, about 13,000 words, uh, plus, I think it was like 20 pages of exhibits. And it goes into who the forger is, the proof, what connects uh, her forgeries with Obama's and what she did, as well as the people who helped and, and also who did the research on the forgery. What was going to be the information in each one of the fields in the in the in the forum? That's what's covered there. You should try to also read a, a three pages of the memorandum of law. It goes into the philosophy of what this is all about. And I'll I'll go into it now so you understand what I had discovered because it was a loophole. And the lawyers didn't spot it, and no one did. All the other cases that have been brought against uh, Obama have been uh, cases regarding challenging his ability to run for office, whether he was a, a natural-born citizen. And what these judges had all done, usually state court, were they would say that they don't have standing. With mine, when I filed it, it's not a criminal case. It's not a civil case. It's other. And there's only, there, this is a loophole. It's a major loophole. And it goes under two laws, misprision of felony and misprision of treason. And both of them were written and created by the very first Congress, second session, and signed into law by George Washington. So there's no question of what the founding fathers intended. The idea is if you're an honest person, you're supposed to report a crime if you learn of it. Now, I'm going to read the two laws. It's very short, so you understand what they were trying to do. Uh, the first one is misprision of felony. It's in Section 4. Whoever having knowledge of the actual commission of a felony recognizable by a court of the United States conceals and does not, as soon as possible, make known the same to some judge or other person in civil or military authority under the United States shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than three years or both. The second one, misprision of treason, whoever owing, it's section 2382 if you wish to read it, whoever owing allegiance to the United States and having knowledge of the commission of any treason against them, conceals and does not as soon as, as may be, disclose and make known the same to, get this, the president or to some judge of the United States or to the governor or to some judge or justice of a particular state is guilty of misprision of treason and shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than seven years or both. So I saw these two laws. My, my background, as you said, is accounting. So I look at the law a little differently than, than the lawyers, who are usually 
programmed to, to deal with certain things in a certain way, more procedural rather than philosophical. When I saw these two laws, I said to myself, hmm, many of the lawyers like Orly Tate and others had used it in their cases in other states. And I had also helped uh, the sheriff in Arizona, Mike Zullo, uh, being the main contact person there. When I read this, and I knew that Arizona wasn't doing anything. I was in Arizona twice. They invited me there. Realized immediately, they, he got a letter from the Mariposa County attorney. And the attorney told them that, told the sheriff that they don't have any jurisdiction. It's, it's either the attorney general of the state or the secretary of state would have to bring a lawsuit against the Democratic Party of Arizona in order, and, and the court case would really be about what are you going to sue him for? putting up a, a candidate that was not eligible to run for president, but what are you going to sue for? For what money? It didn't make any sense. So Mike Zullo and the sheriff decided to try to get it, get a congressman or senator to do something and have congressional hearings. But the problem there is, and which Mike Zullo had found out, the problem is, is the Speaker of the House, Boehner. He won't allow it, period. So they're blocked. When I figured this out, I said, he's, he's not taking the typewriter events, uh, Mike Zulo. They're just focusing on the PDF copy. We're going to do our own thing. At that point, about a year ago, I started collecting, doing the data that I already had from chapters in a, in a book I'm, we're going to be doing, and I focused on the only the facts, like they say, the facts, man, and that's it. And that's what I did. We went through the whole thing, and the pertinent facts of proving Obama's long-form birth certificate called a certificate of live birth, uh, a raving, outright bad forgery, which it truly is. And that's how this whole thing started, and this is the philosophy behind what I did. The, the reason why the clerk here in Seattle posted it as a civil action, because the clerks don't have other. They have either criminal, which you can't file, I can't file as a criminal case because I'm not a U.S. attorney, and I can't, uh, I can do civil, but I'm not suing anybody. I'm not suing, George, uh, you know, uh, Barack Obama or, or the other people involved. I'm reporting a crime. That's all I'm doing. Now, there is a provision that Congress allowed the, the courts to do. In fact, the, the Congress is the one who set up the lower courts. And for instance, they give the job of swearing in new citizens to a U.S. federal judge. Now, that's not a criminal case, not a civil case. It's a job that that the Congress has given them to do. These are two other jobs that Congress gave them to do. You're supposed to report it, both of them, to the court of the United States, which is a judge. And that's what they were saying. They didn't know what to do with it. It, it was hilarious. I had to go back the next day and they had to ask a lawyer there. They had to ask the chief clerk what to do with it. They said, okay, do it and file it as a civil action. And that's what happened. So the judge, when he saw this thing, also, I appear to be the very first person in U.S. history to use these two laws in this fashion. Usually it's a U.S. attorney or even a state attorney that uses these type of laws against someone who knows about a crime firsthand and they use it as blackmail. They say, well, listen, you knew the crime, the bank robbery. You're supposed to have reported it to the police or, or somebody in civil authority, and you didn't. You're going to get three years in prison unless you turn over the evidence you got or tell, tell us what you know. And people are convicted on this thing, a misprision of felony, all the time. But the door swings both ways. So I decided to go through the other side of the door. It's confronted the judge. It, they didn't know what to do. It, it's the ultimate hot potato. That once he, the, what we asked for in the filing is one, that I'm released of criminal liability uh, under misprision of felony and misprision of treason after I presented the evidence. Two, that he corrects his docket so it's not a civil action, it's other. And then finally, that he puts it into a grand jury. Now, he doesn't have much leeway on that part. When you read the, the affidavit, the, the filing to the Ninth Circuit Court, the, the law is pretty clear. If the case and the evidence is in the public interest, which this without question is, I mean, after all, our president could not be a, isn't a U.S. citizen, is a foreign agent, 
a foreign agent who's really the enemy? I think it just mm-hmm. might be in the public interest. The judge is in a, 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 between a rock and a hard place. If he signs off on me and say, okay, you're released from liability, criminal liability, for, for presenting the evidence under these two laws, but it means that he then has the hot potato and he is compelled to put it into a grand jury. The federal statutes say he shall, not may, not it's a good day, the sun's out here in Seattle, I'm going to do it now. No, he's going to put it into a grand jury. When it goes into a grand jury, it's a totally different game then. I will finally wipe the smile off of off the principles of this forgery because when a federal grand jury sends subpoenas out and search warrants, they can't refuse them. If they do, like Onaka and the people in the Department of Health in Hawaii, if they do, they come with another uh, warrant. It's called an arrest warrant, then they arrest them, and then they take the evidence. That's the plan, and that is what I realized when I was reading the laws that I said, this is the best way of doing this. And it's, I saw what the lawyers were doing. I, I knew what Orly was doing was not quite right. It wasn't going to work. So far, I think I've freaked everybody out. Uh, for instance, I, the judge did not say I, I didn't have standing. He said his, ju- his, ju- his court doesn't have, the court can't do it. He's saying that's the weird part. I never saw this before where it says the court doesn't have jurisdiction. Which, of course, it does. It just read you the laws, the two laws. So he's trying to ignore it and avoid it. He's trying to label it something it's not. And I understand the philosophy behind what, we, what I've done here. Yeah, well, I've got to tell you, it's a brilliant strategy in my view because we see uh, Orly Tate's, and, and God bless her, you know, I mean, she, she's out there uh, in the trenches of filing lawsuits. Uh, uh, yeah. You simply filed an affidavit. Now, uh, you filed two, but we're, we're right. just going to collectively call it one. You filed an affidavit with, with the uh, uh, federal court at Seattle, the uh, 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 Western District of Washington, okay? And, and you're you're actually putting the judge on the spot because, by the way, in the manner in which you filed this. So it's really, to me, it's a very brilliant way. Uh, it's an end around. You're actually using the law's to propel this into the federal court system, which I think is fantastic. Otherwise, you'd never see this would never see the light of day. It's been proven for the last what four and a half years. In uh, in the memorandum of law, as well as the appeal to the Ninth Circuit, Federal Rules Criminal Procedures Rule Six A, which states, "quote When the public interest so requires, the court must order that one or more grand juries be summoned." You got it. They have no choice. It's as simple as that. <laughs> and since I didn't just give him the 20 points of forgery, I delivered the forger and some of the other people on a silver platter to them. I had found eight points of forgery and sent an affidavit to the FBI. And Jerome Corsi did an article on, on the thing. I did an affidavit for Orly Tate at the same time. That was how it all started. And I met Paul Irie in Hawaii when Orly uh, had a warrant. Uh, I want people to understand the legal definition of a principle in a in a felony. It's two short sentences. Uh, it's section two of the of the Title 18 Code. Uh, whoever commits an offense against the United States or aids, abets, counsels, commands, induces, or procures its commission is punishable as a principle. B, whoever willing, willfully causes an act to be done, which if directed, performed by him or another, would be an offense against the United States as punishable as a principle. Uh, treason, because they have put a non-U.S. citizen in as President of the United States, and that comes under Section 3592 of the Treason Code, Treason Section, Part two, grave risk to national security. In the commission of the offense, the defendant knowingly created a grave risk of substantial danger to the national security. They did that. Oh, number three is grave risk of death. In the commission of the offense, the defendant knowingly created a grave risk of death to other persons. We know about at least seven or eight people that have been murdered because they knew firsthand knowledge of Barack Obama's queerdom.
Oh, but by the way, folks, this is important, too. What Mr. Vogt is telling us, if, if somebody's going to go out and, and pay like 30 bucks to buy a star and name and buy a star for someone for Christmas, what, what better way? Why don't we all adopt uh, an affidavit for a federal judge? Just go to vector, um, up dot com or Obama or Obama Forgery, Forgery, yeah. com. right? Yeah. And, and let's adopt let's adopt an affidavit. There's uh, over 650 federal judges. I have a, a list already of about 200, and we've started mailing them off of people who have mailed it to us. This is something that we can be proactive in, in doing, in my view, yeah. because I think that this is extremely important. Well, this is one of those times when you can step in. Doug, I got to tell you, you know, doing what you're doing is extremely time consuming, extremely expensive. And for those people who would say, "Well, wait a minute," you know, you know, raising money uh, uh, for something that's not going to make a difference. Hey, this could. You need one person, one judge, right? One judge. Yeah. Well, listen, it costs four hundred and fifty dollars just to file the uh, the appeal in in um, San Francisco. It's four hundred dollars for the uh, to file the case here in Seattle. It's, it costs yeah. money. I want everybody to understand. This is the one loophole they did not expect. That if you read the appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court, it's on online there. I want you to read it, and you'll understand what this case will do. And it might very well go to the Supreme Court to go after these crooked politicians and bureaucrats. It will also uh, get rid of this guy in the White House and the rest of the conspirators uh, of what they've done. Uh, and there's no question it is treason. The the joke of this whole thing to me is they could have – why they were so dumb to pick some guy that didn't have a U.S. Uh, birth certificate. It's just amazing to me. Here you think these communists were, had a brain in their head. They realize he doesn't have a birth certificate. Oh, my God. The, the act of creating the Ford's birth certificate made it a clear-cut case of treason. Uh, Doug, what'd you do? Wake up one morning and say, you know what? Uh, uh, I'm going to file some affidavits here. You've got a history, actually, of, of uh, you've helped others file affidavits, I guess, for orally tapes. And... Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. tell you how it started. Uh, April 27th is when the news conference was in 2011. My friend uh, Barbara, who's a videographer in New York City, she called me up and told me, uh, graphic artists are finding layers in the PDF, because all that he had done at that time was releasing the PDF copy. I said, why don't you look at it? So I did, and I looked at it and said, yeah, it's got layers. And But I looked at it as a typesetter, and I said, wait a minute. I got, And also, since I know t scanners really well, I saw binary type along with grayscale stuff. And I said, wait, that can't be. What's going on? The, later, I did figure out exactly how the forger did the PDF, but I replicated the whole thing. I know exactly what she did. So uh, that's what started me off. And then Orly Tate called me up in the middle of – next month. And, uh, then I wrote a, uh, I had found eight points of forgery and sent an affidavit to the FBI. And Jerome Corsi did an article on on the thing. I did an affidavit for Orly Tate at the same time. And that was how it all started. And I met Paul Irie in Hawaii when Orly uh, had a warrant, she paid for me and Paul to go to Hawaii with her. I think that was in July of 2011. And that's when I met Paul, and we, we hit it off real great. I mean, two typesetters, right? what the hell? There's plenty to talk about. That's how our our um, history together started. Real nice fellow. Uh, and and that was that's how it started really. Yeah. Just to be just to be clear, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the affidavit, the, the people involved, and, and I'm kind of going to just interject this because um, this will give give some uh, uh, folks you can think about this. Obviously, Barack Hussein Obama, uh, number one. Number two, Robert Bauer, the former White House Counsel. Uh, now he's the one who ordered the actual forgery to be picked up and yep. delivered. Okay. Now, remember, folks, uh, April 27th, 2011, uh, just days before the Osama bin Laden takedown alleged, uh, this is when this uh, th this forgery was presented to the American public. Uh, Daniel Pfeiffer, the director of communications for Obama, Judith Corley, private counsel to the president, uh, Dr. Uh, Shimone, I guess it is, a Fuku, uh, Fukino, the former yeah, director Fukino, of the right, yeah. Okay. Right. All right. And Neil Abercrombie, any of these names sounding familiar? And, and here's where it gets interesting, I, I think. 
Jane, or I'm sorry, John Doe number one in the registrar's office. And by the way, folks, or in the sealed affidavit, John Doe number one is identified. John, uh, Savannah Guthrie, oh my goodness, the White House reporter at the time for MSNBC. And John Doe two, John Doe three, John Doe four, top executives. Listen to this, folks. Top executives. At General Electric, National Broadcasting Company, that's, that would be NBC, the executive producer of the Today Show, uh, yeah, John Doe 6, John Doe 7, John Doe 8, and here's the key, Jane Doe 1, who has been identified in the sealed affidavit, who knows the forger, and acted as, listen to this, a spy for or the Obama administration, also disseminated other forged certificates of live birth to throw off investigators with respect to the importance of the birth certificate number, okay? This is all important stuff here. And Jane Doe, too, also identified in the sealed affidavit, who, uh, according to Mr. Vogt, he believes is the actual forger, the person who actually did the forgeries of the certificates of live birth. So those are the people involved, some of them. Let's say also, on the people you were mentioning in the list, um, I want people to understand uh, the legal definition of a principle in a, in a felony. It's two short sentences. Uh, it's Section 2 of the of the Title 18 Code. Uh, whoever commits an offense against the United States or aids, abets, counsels, commands, induces, or procures its commission is punishable as a principal. B, whoever willing, uh, willfully causes an act to be done, which if directed, performed by him or another, would be an offense against the United States is punishable as a principal. So that's why the people at... GE and NBC and the others mentioned are principles, not just a fel not just a forgery case, which the statute of limitations I think is five years, but uh, uh, treason because they have put a non-U.S. citizen in as president of the United States, and that comes under Section 3592 of the treason code, treason section, part two, grave risk to national security. In the commission of the offense, the defendant knowingly created a grave risk of substantial danger to the national security. They did that. Right. And so those two out of three give you the death sentence. That's what section 3592 is, is the death sentence. So there is no statute of limitations on any offense that carries with it a death sentence. So there is no statute of limitations, period. So and what they could, did. Wow. Okay. They hang. So, they hang. They will hang. Wow. For what they uh, did. This right. is, I want people to understand, this is the worst crime in American history. There's none worse you could find. This is amazing. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, wow. All right. And you, by, by you doing your research and investigation, and because of your knowledge, your background, your, knowing what you're talking about, you discover this. And if you don't speak up, you could be on this list if you don't turn this over. Oh, I, True? I was, unlike, unlike Breitbart and the other gentleman, the reporter, they bragged, or part of the media, and that would, may have been one of the problems, and if they had just presented this stuff without bragging, they would have been just fine. That's why I was very quiet for the last year, year and a half. I let Paul do some of the court cases with Orly, not me. They have all the evidence there. That's why both of them have been notarized, so it doesn't matter if I'm here on this planet or not. Any prosecutor, any grand jury can use this evidence. It's very clear, very clean, to wind up bringing these people to justice. This is fabulous. It, it is, and this, uh, folks, this is the way to do it. I mean, from from my point of view as an investigator, you don't announce, you don't telegraph, you don't uh, no. post on a blog. You know, hey, you leave your ego doing. out of it. The, the hard evidence and how bad this forgery is. Now, remember, you can't exactly advertise for a forger to do the world's greatest forgery. It just doesn't work. He had chosen somebody he knew from Hawaii when they were in school. Now, the, what gave it away is this person's father's obituary. I already, know, I already knew she had done the forgery. It's not just one thing she did on it. But there's a whole bunch of things that are, are similar or gave it away. But the connection between the two of them 
led to Frank Marshall Davis and the union, and I knew immediately how they met. So that's that gave it away. Uh, it's, it's called so connecting the dots. There you go. This yeah. you're you're revealing a lot. So the subjects, we'll call her Jane Doe. Uh, right. Her father's obituary, and also the Frank Marshall Davis factor, which we have to get into a little bit because really at the 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 backbone of this, the basis of this is really oh, yeah. the installation of a uh, of a uh, well the coup, a coup of the United States, take over the United States. But anyway, right. by the that, communists. Yeah. <clears throat> the first the first birth certificate was the the short form. I had heard about it. What was wrong with it? They had two mistakes on it. One, to figure out a great secret, you have to find that point in time that either one group of people did something that another group of people have to react to. What caused them to create other forgeries uh, was a mistake they did on the short form. And the mistake was putting August 8, 61 as the registration date for the Department of Health, and they get the birth certificates in from the hospitals, the definition is all under the word file, filing, and registration. It's all done the same day. Uh, a birth certificate comes in, the registrar or the deputy registrar will look it over, make sure nothing's been crossed out. It's been signed in black indelible ink. They'll date it on either the local registrar and the state registrar, one and the same in Hawaii. It's the same office. And then she'll sign the as a registrar, and then they'll number it. And that's called completes the job of registration. So the file is when it first comes in. The filing prod is when they go through the thing, and then uh, if they number it, then it goes into the formal records, the books. Now it's computer systems. Computer is held by the Department of Health in the state, and they wind up transmitting a form to the local offices, if there are any, and they fill out the birth certificate information, and the state office populates the field for the birth certificate number. The first thing they made the mistake was uh, August 8th. It should have been August 11th. So they rec somebody in the Department of Health must have recognized the error. So what they did is they generated another forgery, and it was a short form that had a woman who was dead since, I don't know, I think since... 50 years. Her name was Patricia DeCosta. She was born in 1930 and died, I think, in 1962 or something like that. Uh, all of, by, by magic, her her birth certificate shows up and the newspaper publishes it. It's It was off no less than 199 days. But the forgeries they created, one was 199 days off and others were 25 days off. I mean, it just can't be. Then you know you got a forgery. You know, if it's in the beginning of the year and you have a high number, it's mostly a forgery. If you have one, somebody was born on the end of the year and it's a low number, it's probably a forgery. So, so the certificate okay. number is, in fact, a, a security feature. And that's a separate felony, by the way. It gives you five years in prison just to forge the number. In this case, the certificate number assigned to Barack Hussein Obama's birth certificate or certificate was 10641. They were stuck with that number. They were committed to the data on that short form. Now, the things wow. that, that gave it away, that really destroyed it, is one woman who did, and that was Eleanor Nordite. When she released her daughter's birth certificates, uh, she released them on July 28th of 09. She sh proudly shows her two birth certificates born at the same hospital. Their numbers were 10,637 and 10,638. But there was something unusual about the numbers. The number in those days were created by what they call a Bates numbering machine. And they're on metal wheels. And the escapement, I think, was 10.2 points each, the width of each one of these things. On the metal wheels, sometimes ink dries out or gets sticky. And the wheel sometimes doesn't seat properly all the way to the baseline. So all the numbers would be across on a baseline. The 06 on theirs were above the baseline, and so was Obama's. <laughs> it means it means his had to have been done on the 11th, three digits after Gretchen Nordite. That's what oh, my goodness. Him. So I proved that the date, a registration date was a, a forgery, and that the number was stolen most likely from Virginia Sonohara, who I made friends with the brother, uh, Mrs. Nordite sunk him single-handedly. 
let let history record that. Of course, I'm the one who who proved it, but that's what happened. Then the type. Then you have the uh, Onaka signature. It was his signature on the short form. Right. And that's a state registrar. You'll see on state registrar, I move, I copied the S from the beginning from the word state, and put it next to the R in register at the end of the line. And the S is a full point smaller than the R. That's impossible. The forger deliberately made the type larger at the end of the line. Now, you have to appreciate this. The easiest thing in the world for a forger to do is to copy a registrar stamp. Why is she making errors in it? Now, that's not the only one. All the others had the same kind of thing, but different kind of errors. Everything from changing the word spacing between the words to letting the line spacing between line to line has to be the same. And also, the, le- the letters at the end of the line are larger than the, the, the letters in the beginning of the line, and that's impossible. Why, why? would – why? Yeah, I'll Go tell ahead. you why. It's real simple. Plausible deniability. It's to give plausible deniability to the registrar. You don't put deliberate errors in not just one. We're talking about four or five of these things. Every single one, short forms or long forms, had errors in the registrar stamp. It's a forgery. This certification is a forgery. It's not mine. They were committed. They were committed now. Okay, so oh, yeah. go ahead. They had no choice. Anyway, it's just, that just covered the first three points of forgery. So you have the first three now. The fourth one is about NBC and the, uh, the news conference. News conference, they had a, a pre-news conference with the, with the real newsmen, and that was at 8.48 a.m. on the 27th. The sequence of events was Robert Bauer sends a letter to Hawaii and sends it to Perkins Coie, his firm, in Seattle, and he has uh, a lawyer there, uh, his, uh, supposedly the, uh, the president's attorney, go to Hawaii and pay for the birth certificates and then fly back to Washington, D.C. There was, it was no rush to do this. Of course, we found out two days later when the SEALs basically whacked uh, Osama bin Laden. That was the reason. They, went. they were hoping that anybody who found the for- forgeries or, or found problems with it would be buried by the Osama bin Laden news, and that did work. And the, the news media was uh, culpable in, in burying the story. And how I nailed Savannah Guthrie and NBC and General Electric. You have to go back to... 2008, General Electric owns a company called GE Capital. GE Capital uh, is the organization that basically funds General Electric big installations, you know, leasing and purchasing of big equipment. They also got into home loans. And when they did, they got stuck with a bunch of paper that they that was unproducing. The uh, When the TARP funds came out, they wanted to get money from the TARP funds to bail them out. But they couldn't because they weren't a bank. They weren't a savings loan either, so they weren't eligible. But the Obama administration cut a deal. They changed the rules, and they let GE Capital unload $340 billion in bad paper and only had to pay $2.3 billion for the insurance policy. In other words, we taxpayers, each one of us got $1,129 $1,129 of that debt. Don't you feel good about it? A few years later, when Obama had to produce a long-form birth certificate, now this is key, because Jerome Corsi, who who they feared the most, was going to produce this book, was going to say, well, where's the birth certificate? And it was going to be released in May, beginning of May, first week or second week of May. So they had to come up with something, and they did. They came up with this Ford's birth certificate. I then started thinking in terms of deliverables. The deliverable, there was four deliverables she did. The first one was a regular birth certificate as if it came from the hospital, but with the registrar stamp on it and the two date stamps. That's all she had to do, which she did. The original forms are on white paper. When she created the first deliverable, she used a a feature in Photoshop called Unsharp Mask, which basically takes a couple of pixels around each one of the items and leaves a white dot. It it makes it sharper. It looks like it's sharper. She did this to clean it up. But evidently, somebody got cold feet in the Department of Health. It could have been Onaka, but I don't know. That's the job of a grand jury to go find out. What happened was... The forger then had to hurriedly, I don't know how much time she had, whether she had a week 
or a few days or what. I don't know. But it obviously was enough time to, to, to do the forgery from scratch. So she had to use what she already had, which had this white halo around it, and she married it with the green security paper, which is called basket weave. It's not really security paper. I was able to buy a whole ream. That's 500 sheets for 35 bucks. So there is no security here when you can buy the stuff for 35 bucks, period. He didn't want to do it on there. So she must have run this thing out on an inkjet, 11 by 17 inkjet printer. And then she trimmed it to the 8.5 by 11 size. We know it's an 8.5 by 11 size by, by Savannah Guthrie's uh, iPhone photo that she took of it. It was a, a it was eight and a half inches wide and it was eleven inches long. So it trimmed it, but it's most likely only printed the security paper on one side. Therefore, they didn't want to show anybody this document. That's why they asked in there, "Are we going to be able to see it uh, in the news conference?" Is any of us going to be able to see it? I'll, I'll read it. This is right from the the transcript of the White House news conference. And the newsman said, "Question." And is this going to sound, well, I mean, you can just uh, anticipate what people are going to remain unconvinced. They're going to say that this is just a photocopy of a piece of paper. Could you have typed anything in there? Will the actual certificate be on display or viewable at any? And then there was laughter in the room. Now, that's illogical. It's a good question. It's a logical question. It means some of the newsmen in that room knew the thing was a forgery. And nobody was going to see it. That's the thing that should make everybody mad. We have controlled news. Kiss off the First Amendment. Will the president be holding it? Now, get this. Will the president be holding it? And they say no. He says, Pfeiffer says, he will not. And I will not leave it here for him to do so. But it will, and it goes on. In other words, that's plausible deniability for the president. So Obama could say, oh, I didn't know. I didn't see what, it, well, I didn't see what you guys brought. Or what they had. All yep. right. It had to have come from either a direct copy or a high-resolution scan from an original. And the only people who have originals is the Department of Health. She got components from the Department of Health. The, the uh -huh. type of the form itself, the Cheltenham, is too clean, too clear to have come from a microfilm copy. Th th it that's pretty have, damaging. Wow. Oh, I okay. have like four or five... That four or five cases of that that points right to the Department of Health. There's not a, it's, it's, this is only one. I've got a lot more. So back to back to our friends at General Electric and NBC. One of the questions the reporters had. So they they handed this thing out. I think it was Judith Crowley. It was the lawyer. She came back into Washington D.C. delivered the two copies she got from Hawaii, and evidently the White House copied one of the copies on a black and white copier. And they copied it and gave it and made packets up for all the newsmen that were coming up the next day, next morning. Uh, handed them all out. Now, one side was the copy of the long form, and the other side was a copy of the short form. The, one of the last questions that were asked in the news conference is this. Question. You've got two certified copies according to this study. You have these physical, dash, uh, Mr. Pfeiffer. Yes, I showed you one, just one. Question. Uh, you showed us a photocopy of one, Pfeiffer. No, I showed you. They didn't finish the sentence, so they didn't write down what it was. Question, does that have a stamp? Now, he's talking about the Department of Health round embossed stamp. Uh, Mr. Pfeiffer, it has a seal on it. Now, as the reporter did not see the seal on his reporter's copies. Now, one of the exhibits in there clearly show I have examples of seven or eight other birth certificates. The, the seal from the Department of Health is an embossed seal. What embossing does, it literally punches holes into the paper. The seal becomes part of the paper. When they copied the two copies or the single copy from Hawaii on the copy machine, the green source light on most copiers dropped out the background color of the security paper, and all evidence of a round seal disappeared. That means, uh, and uh, one of the exhibits you'll see, the White House one the PD, from the PDF is just really a remnant, a remnant image of a, something round. You can't make out anything. It was most likely done by a feature in Photoshop called a watermark. On Savannah Guthrie's, if you highlight, change the color depth and stuff like that, you can then see the same kind of a, a, a latent image of one, but it is not a seal. On the other ones, you'll see a, 
uh, on the other ones, even a copy of a copy in black and white, you can clearly see the embossed seal on all of them except hers. There was no Department of Health seal on that thing. That's why I was so brazen and bold to list her and the executives from NBC. But now you know the whole story. It was because the Obama administration basically bought two networks, NBC and MSNBC, for $340 billion of our taxpayer money, so they have a propaganda ministry. And, and oh, by the way, how is Savannah Guthrie's career doing? Um, what happened after she... Oh, yeah, uh, I, I, it's, I, it's in the affidavit. Basically, <laughs> within nine or uh, 12 days, she was promoted to the co-host of the 9 a.m. Today Show, and about a year later, they, they fired unsanctimoniously the lady who was the co the co-host on the regular morning today show and put in savannah guthrie so she did it for her career is my belief she did her performance as you can see from the from the transcript from the news conference the reporters didn't see any seal on it they refused to show the seal to anybody or the the documents to anybody there and they they said they weren't going to let or leave it around there for Obama to see it. Now here you got two copies. You spent at least seven to ten thousand dollars for a high priced lawyer to fly from Seattle to Hawaii, Hawaii to Washington DC, and you're not gonna keep a copy for yourself? How stupid <laughs> do they think we are? It was a clear chain of custody for the reporter's copy, thanks to the governor and Fuddy and the White House clearly told us where it came from, that they witnessed the copying of the original they said the original birth certificate on the security paper where the registrar stamped it and signed it and gave it to Crowley, who wound up bringing it to Washington, D.C. There's a clear chain of custody, and then they, they, they admitted they copied it, they gave it to the newsman, and then one of the newsmen at ABC put it up on the website. It was a high-resolution scan, too. Uh, let's talk about the content of the birth certificate here. Is this a good time to, to segue into the content? Oh, why not? It, it, it really doesn't matter. There's, there's so much here. <laughs> the, we're talking content. We're talking the age of the father, right? Mm -hmm. the, the age of the father at the time of the birth was actually 27 years old, not 25. That is a major faux pas. <laughs> Supposedly the father is there at the birth in Hawaii. The nurse comes up to you and say, what's your age and stuff like that. There was no reason for him to lie. He only started lying about his age about two years later, a year and a half later, when he was trying to get into Harvard as a foreign student. Now, his birth, his passport didn't lie. He was born, um, it was a June 18th, 1934, not 1936. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The, the, the guy who did the research on the birth certificate screwed up. He got the information, must have from the from the um, Harvard University, and where he lied and said he was thirty. He was born 1936, or he would have been 25, and that's where he, that guy goofed. That's a major goof. So the lie of the father has caught the son. It would be creation of this. Just to remind people, um, and, and the Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, but this does contain essentially the signature or the hallmark or the fingerprint of the forger. Am I? Is that a fair statement? <clears throat> when she did, uh, I'll preface it by saying this: If you're a forger and you're going to create the world's greatest forgery for a foreign agent to become president of a country to destroy the country from within. Are you going, aren't you going to put some symbol, some sign on that great work so you can take the credit for it? Uh, well, she did. She actually damaged or added uh, every letter that made up a part of her name. Wouldn't you? Uh, I mean, I, I'm not, total, I, I, I can't say. Not, that is, that's box. what's in the sealed affidavit. And okay. my my desire is not to identify her. The judges know it. They they unsealed the the sealed affidavit. I think so did the clerk too. Uh, if the Ninth Circuit Court wants it, we told them we'd send them the sealed uh, under seal, of course. Uh, okay. But no, it's it's there for a reason that that has to be sealed. And it's not just that, but yes, she did sign the document. And there's other things. It's not just one thing. It's five or six other things, including a slanted H on both of their, on both of their documents.
<laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty funny. 